we are in an unprecedented historical period. Um, we've been seeing widespread, sustained, and large-scale demonstrations opposing state violence and demanding racial justice. We're also in a global pandemic and in the midst of an economic crisis that is forecasted to continue and actually get more dire. So within that context of the pandemic and the economic crisis, we also are dealing with the response to structural racism. So we're thinking about how racism is not just kind of individually um, mediated or modulated between human beings, right? So person to person, but also how differential access, differential life chances that are racially inscribed are baked into every aspect of our society. So that's from our institutions to policies and practices to what people's kind of general life chances are. So within this context of pandemic, within this context of economic austerity and, and crisis, we also see a response to structural racism at which the kind of spear point of the enforcement of structural racism is policing. The work that the Black Lives Matter Global Network has done to popularize the slogan Black Lives Matter and their ability to deeply permeate the social and cultural consciousness around the world is really tremendous. And I'm not sure that I can think of another cultural intervention that rivals it. That said, the media calling worldwide protests Black Lives Matter protests does a couple things that I think are potentially dangerous. So first, I think it has made a relatively small group of people responsible for what millions of people do globally. And in so doing, puts real targets on their backs as the acting secretary of Homeland Security has announced publicly that he's cooking up charges against Black Lives Matter leaders and hoping for their arrests. Do you think Department of Homeland Security is getting the help it needs from the Justice Department? Why haven't we seen the leaders of Antifa and BLM arrested and charged for conspiracy under, say, RICO, like the heads of the mafia families were? Well, this is something I've talked to the AG personally about, uh, and I know that they are working on it. We're not so far, I don't think, from the heyday of COINTELPRO to have forgotten that the serious implications of this kind of governmental program of targeting perceived and actual leadership of Black movements. So we need to take this very, very seriously. So that's the first thing. The second thing that calling everything Black Lives Matter protests does is it undermines the long-term organizing necessary for real structural change, as well as the breadth, depth, and scale of movement working today for a Black people's agenda. It's unreasonable, I think, to expect Black Lives Matter as a single group to bring about systemic transformation at the scale necessary today. And I think it's irresponsible to make that single group take the full force of the repression that's being threatened by the state. The demand to defund the police being amplified as it is from the uprising since George Floyd's murder, acknowledge the structural racism inherent in policing and other forms of state-sanctioned violence. So many imagine the transfer of resources moving from policing as one of the primary institutions of harm to Black people, and specifically into the health and well-being of Black communities. That added dimension, I think, rests on an acknowledgement that increasing the well-being and safety of Black people means rising tides and improved conditions for all people. And then finally, I think there are some people who tie the demand to defund the police to the eventual abolition of policing. They see defunding as only the first step to really addressing the structural violence of policing. To the question of strategic wisdom, I'm not sure I think that it's responsible for me to answer that in a blanket way. My general sense, I guess, is that um, it's a smart demand because it speaks directly to community priorities. It highlights the fact that many cities are putting upwards of half their general funds toward policing, even as they close libraries and after school programs and parks and similar programs that support community well-being.
So it deals with the real material impacts of prioritizing containment and control over health and genuine safety. I think four more years of the Trump of a Trump presidency would increase the pain that we're feeling of structural racism under the administration as it exists. And I think we would continue to see the administration dismantle many of the even meager protections that are in place for um, the people who are kind of most vulnerable, most vulnerable to state action because of their race, because of their gender, or because of their economic status. Well, I'm not exactly sure what will happen under a Biden administration, I do feel confident that life, even under a neoliberal Democrat like Biden, will be better than life has been under the racist, racist fascistic Trumpism that we've been living with for nearly four years. My guess is that Biden's own commitment to law and order, not to mention Kamala Harris's commitment there, will far outweigh any obligations he might feel to the people of color who will have gotten him elected. And I think we should make no mistake. If Biden manages to get elected, it will be Black and Latinx voters who are responsible for that. My sense, though, is that he is situationally committed to racial justice, that Joe Biden is situationally committed to racial justice um, rather than permanently committed. So while things will certainly be less oppressive under Biden than under Trump, I cannot say that I'm feeling particularly rosy about what that future might be under Biden for people who care about racial justice.